Another talent-equated matchup game is nearly here for Ohio State. Buckeyes hitting the road on Saturday to Happy Valley, and they are going to play the number three Penn State Nittany Lions. What a coincidence. It's Thursday, and that's one, two, three, uh, three things Thursday. One for each of Penn State's points in the rankings. That doesn't make sense. That's not how this works, but that's Jeremy Birmingham. I'm Austin Ward. It's the Podcast Daily, and it is Three Things Thursday. How positive is this version of Berm going to be today? I don't know. I mean, I guess we'll see. We never, I never know what the topics are. Um, I, I'm, I'm beginning to feel a little less hungover from last weekend's um, lackadaisical, lethargic performance against Nebraska, and it's time to move on. You can't uh, live in the past. You know what I mean? Yeah, only forward. That's the only way. So let me put it to you this way for thing number one. What is a criticism of this Ohio State team that you don't agree with? I don't agree with the criticism or the notion or the idea that Ryan Day or any of his coaches or any players on this team are soft. Uh, I think it is absolutely stupid when people say it. I think it is something that people say because Jim Harbaugh made a comment. And I think it's weird that people in the Ohio state fan base who have made it a made a living in the last couple of years, pointing out how Michigan cheated and they did, and then still use Michigan's um, opinion of Ryan day as though it is gospel in some way. And, I do understand that there are questions about whether or not Ryan Day's style of leadership translates to the field as far as the on-field performance from Ohio State. I do not think that that is a, an issue of whether or not these guys are soft or not. I think the very notion that players are praying together before a game makes them soft is insane. Uh, I, don't, I don't know why that has become a, a sticking point for people. Um, I, I guess I'm remembering the old days of Ohio state football where people were absolutely incensed when Terrell Pryor said something like everyone kills people, steals from me, steals from you. Um, (laughs) I don't know that Ohio state players need to have their eye black, say kill everybody like the Alabama players do. Um, I, I guess we live in just a different time where people feel like, you can just take personal shots at people all the time as opposed to trying to have um, conscientious criticism of what their performance is as opposed to making it an individual slash personal attack. And I, I, I know that's sort of the world we live in now, but I, I definitely do not agree that these guys are soft. We've seen what they do in person. We've seen it up close and personal and how hard they work and wh- how, how much time and energy they put into preparing for what they're doing. And I, I just think it's a really kind of sick way to try and construct criticism around the team. Yeah, I the questions and comments that we have received and seen about, you know, the prayer circle after Nebraska strikes me as a bit like some of the furor over the pregame dance routine a year ago when it had been I think the prayer stuff with opponents has been going on much longer, perhaps not during Carmen, Ohio. The timing maybe did not work out ideally for Ohio State last week, um, which certainly put it in a different light and a different perspective um, than maybe we've seen. Every team that I've covered in the entirety of my career has had some people praying with their opponents throughout. Bobby Carpenter made this point. It's very commonly accepted. Former Buckeyes were making this point. It's been going on forever at every level of college football. And the same thing was true about some of the pregame dance routines that the wide receivers were doing with the quarterbacks and how loose the team would be. And it it never becomes a problem until you're not winning games. And I don't think that you could point to uh, a dance circle or a prayer circle or any kind of circle being the issue for Ohio State not playing its best game against Nebraska last week or leading it to lose games against Michigan. So if we want to talk about like finesse, like Ohio State's offensive line and defensive lines have not been national championship contenders caliber uh, performers. Like they have not played smash mouth football, but 
that's a separate issue to the things that they might do before or after a game, in my personal opinion. Yeah. That's a style of play that is a perhaps a fair criticism that maybe they are not as um, physically manhandling their opponents as people would like to see. But that does not mean these people are soft. It does not mean that you would want to, if you were anybody watching this or any football fan across the country, want to run your mouth to one of these guys. Like you, <laughs> it wouldn't work for you. It would not go well. Um, is, is now again, the the reality is we are living in a very difficult time. And especially, I mean, it's it's hard for us covering this team because the expectations coming into the season were so high that the when things don't reach the expectation. Uh, or don't look the way we ex thought it would. I think the reaction almost um, immediately becomes equally as uh, like it's deep Pol or Im polarized. immediately as extreme. Yeah, it's it's a polarized thing, and I, I I know for myself, like I mean, one of the things I've been thinking all week, and not not that we're gonna deviate too much, or uh, this isn't like part two of the three thoughts Thursday, but. We're probably too hard on them uh, as a team at, at times, and we're also probably a little too soft on them as as a team at times. I, I get extremely, I don't know if I'm frustrated is the right word. I don't know if uh, I think we're doing it the right way because this week I've seen a number of comments that we're way too hard and way too critical on this team. Some weeks we're homers. Some weeks we're we're too critical. I don't know what the sweet spot is. I I I don't know that. I understand the notion or the um, commentary that we're trying to be friends with the coaches or anything like that when we don't criticize them as human beings, um, because I don't think anyone would do that with people that you're working in close quarters with. And we see these guys a lot. I don't know that. I mean, it's, I, I think it's weird to expect media to come right out and be like, that guy sucks and his family should lose their, their livelihood because a block doesn't get made in a game. Like I, I just feel like there's this weird disconnect. And some of it, I, as we've talked about before, I, I don't know, maybe we created this by buying too much the preseason hype, but uh, I don't think that's a local media problem. I think it was a national media expectation as well. So um, it, it's just a weird vibe. And, and maybe uh, this week, I, I feel like I've maybe contributed to it. And I, I don't want to do that. I want to take a step back and realize that you're, these guys are playing a game and sometimes you don't play the game perfectly. Yeah, that's true. And you also find out what teams, what players, what coaching staffs are made of when times get tough. And yes, they did win. And yes, they responded in the fourth quarter. There is value in that. But we also got questions when we've talked about you know, the leadership of this team and the veteran players who've come back and they said, well, Austin, you said all year that they had something to prove. There would be no complacency, that there was great leadership on this team. Berm, you you said they they were ready. They they went through the trials and tribulations of the offseason, which is not easy. And they didn't have to do that. And they could be in the NFL. Those things are that's still true. Yeah, they. But you you go to the ultimate test when you lose a game. Or when you don't play your best game. That's happened the last two times that Ohio State has stepped on the field. It does not mean that Jack Sawyer, JT Tuimoloau, Emeka Ibuka, Cody Simon, Denzel Burke, they, that they can't react and respond to that on Saturday. I don't, I don't, you did earlier in the week pick Penn State to win. I don't know if you're still going to do that on Friday when it comes to bold predictions, but I know that it won't surprise you. If the veteran players on Ohio State's team come out and play their best perform, give their best performance on Saturday and win, like no, we're not, no. there's no reason to write this team off, right? And the thing is, like, yeah, you know, there are things that have been said all off season, but those things are being said because that's what has been said to us. That is what that is what those players have said, and I, I don't. I think it's a dangerous precedent to just assume every time someone's talking to you, um, whether it's on the record or off, that they are gassing you up or that they're lying directly or that they are trying to sell a narrative. Uh, you know, we cover college football for a living, not politics. I'm not interested in assuming that every word that comes out of someone's mouth is a lie. Uh, and so <laughs> if, if the things that I am hearing from these people uh, are 
And a lot of times we do have conversations with coaches off the record, and they're the ones saying these things. This team feels different. This team looks different. And then, yeah, as you mentioned, now here we are. It's heading into November, and they've got punched in the mouth. And we're going to see real quick exactly what this team is made of. I I think maybe if I have one like complaint about myself this week, it's that I let what I feel is an anomaly of anomaly in the Ryan Day era, and I do not count the Missouri game, so I want to be very clear. I don't consider that game even a, a game that matters, um, where that team did not look prepared to play on Saturday at all. And uh, I I'm, I probably am putting too much stock into that performance when that's never happened in the Ryan Day era. And now if, if it comes out Saturday and happens again, uh, fair, I'll, I'll own it and I'll talk about it as much as we have uh, the Nebraska one. But I do believe more and more as we head towards the end of the week that this is a, a team that very well, and it's not to excuse this because it should never happen, but I, I just don't think they paid any attention to Nebraska after they watched Nebraska get beat by 49 points by Indiana. I think they just said, you know what? We're going to do what we do. We're not going to we're not going to get too far into our uh, game prep for this game. Focus on what's coming after. And like, it's the little things about this Nebraska game that have made me think that in the last few days. Like, I know full well that they're going to have tight ends helping the left side of the offensive line against Penn State. Like you're going to, and they didn't try it at all against Nebraska, and uh, or decided to not use it at all. And I don't, I do not believe these guys are incompetent. So um, now, I believe at times maybe they overthink, but I don't think you go into that Nebraska game and just abandon everything you know you're going to have to do against Penn State just for fun. Like I think it might have been somewhat a test of on their own part but maybe that's me wanting to gloss yeah, things I'm, over I don't, know. I don't know it's possible they might have also seen what happened on the opening drive of the game for nebraska and that shanked punt and just be like well button it up boys we're gonna get through this one pretty easily and that can happen too they are human beings with real life emotions and a pulse um i'm a real life human being too and berm you know that i love nothing more than anonymous coaches previewing matchups and saying nice, whatever nice. they want right like i yeah. just i, I nice. live for it um the end of the athletics uh preview for ohio state penn state this week i read it on wednesday morning bruce feldman and ralph russo teaming up on that bad boy um i thought they i will give them credit they were a lot more specific about the coaches that they seem to be talking to than some others i've read where they really drive me insane um but they they capped it off with a conversation about Will Howard. And this coach said, well, I don't want to call him a game manager, but he doesn't need to be a superhero. He needs to be a point guard. I, I disagree with the criticisms of Will Howard. And I've done that previously because I've said I don't know that he has to throw a ton of defaults for Ohio State to win. If he'd have thrown more than two last week, we might have been having a very different conversation about the Ohio State-Nebraska game. But setting that aside... Uh, this idea that like anyone could just have stepped in and be doing what Will Howard is doing for the Ohio State offense, I think is a fallacy. Um, and I'm glad that I actually have someone, even if it was an anonymous coach, that I can argue with that's not a straw man. Will Howard is doing way more than managing games for Ohio State. And the Oregon game would not have been a one-point game without him playing at quarterback. And I don't know how many quarterbacks there are that could have been in that situation and made some of the plays that he made. And I think with the Ohio State offensive line situation, he may well have to be closer to a superhero to do some of the things, eluding pressure, stepping up in the pocket, extending outside of it with his legs. He's made plays, including the Quinshawn Judkins throw, uh, including a touchdown uh, against Oregon the week before where he had to be on the move and make those plays that, frankly, we we definitely didn't see a year ago for a variety of reasons, but are going to be imperative for Ohio State. It is not just about him, I think, needing to run the football more against Penn State, which is another thing that you mentioned we may not have seen against Nebraska because they didn't think they had to use that. I think Will Howard can do everything that you need to run the Ohio State offense, and I don't know that he's still getting enough credit for the way he's doing it. Uh, I agree. And uh, A, I, I didn't know the athletic was still covering sports, so that's cool. Uh, <laughs> B, I, I think that we saw idea, Ralph Russo before the Oregon game. Come the on. The idea 
that saying someone doesn't have to be a superhero is an insult to them. I, I don't agree with like he doesn't he he shouldn't have to be a superhero playing quarterback at Ohio State. It that is considerably different than saying he can't be. And uh, I think we have seen Will Howard be much more than anyone expected him to be or thought he would need to be for these first seven weeks. And I think that's only going to get more and more important to to your point over these next uh, handful of weeks because the offensive line situation will dictate it. Um, but also we see a guy that is more and more confident, a guy more and more getting comfortable as the the face of the Ohio State football team and a guy that, like, if you talk to Will Howard or, like, there is nothing about his personality that screams game manager to me. Okay, Like, right. this is a kid who, if Ohio State needs him to throw the ball 45 times a game, is going to do it, and I have zero doubt that he will do it extremely well. Yeah, and I sometimes we do that. That thing that we heard that we really liked, uh, Will Howard's post-game press conference and the way he talked about Penn State, that's the kind of edge, chippiness, competitiveness, I think, that, you know, maybe, maybe this team could use more of that. I don't know. It. Bobby described it uh, on Monday as like a lot of introverts on this team. Will Howard's not that. Like, it, if he and Caleb Downs are going to be the ones that have to be the extroverts for this team, so be it. Like, I think Will Howard is very comfortable in doing that. But that um, was neither here nor there for my point. Nor is it part of thing number one. Thing number two, as I've mentioned throughout this week, Berm, I am just in a perpetually confused state about you know what to make of this team what to make of saturday against nebraska what's going to happen on saturday against penn state i don't know how confused you feel but what is one thing that you are absolutely certain about this team that you will see on saturday i will say i don't know that i can recall in the time that we've been covering this team together or even in you know uh, independent of one another that i have felt like I had less of a pulse on exactly where this team is going between last week and this week. Like <laughs> it is hard to tell. Um, what I'm absolutely certain of, however, goes back to what we were just talking about. And so Will Howard is going to put Ohio State in a position to win the game on Saturday, one way or another. Um, so I, I, I feel confident that the Buckeyes are going to be in a position to win that game on Saturday, no matter how bad last Saturday looked, no matter how low they may be coming off the Oregon loss. I, I I do not have any doubt that Will Howard is not only physically capable of doing the things that are required to win the game, but being able to bring other guys along with him. And uh, I, I think we will see a, a fired up version of Will Howard on Saturday because A, the team needs it, because B, he's not going to be able to hide it. And, and so I am, I'm 100% confident that Will Howard is going to put the Buckeyes in a position to win the game on Saturday. I mean, that's the other part about his post-game comments on Saturday. It's like, there's no backtracking from that. You say you're going to show Penn State why you were good enough or not good enough to play there. Like, that's that's opening up. That's not a guarantee of a victory or guarantee of a great performance. But you're 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 writing a check. And you got to see if you can cash it. I, I I love that part that he's willing to bet on himself. That that to me, I I keep saying it. That's another glimpse at the kind of competitor in person he is. Yes, 100%. Yeah. And I'm, I feel the same way about Emeka Ibuka and how critical he's going to be for Ohio State to reach their ceiling, not just in terms of championships, but on Saturday against Penn State. Uh, he's got to touch the football more than three times. I don't care if it's all through the passing game. I don't care. I would like to see it be a pop pass or an in around and get involved in the rushing tech. However, it can be again on special teams. I don't know, but Emeka Ibuka needs to touch the football at least 10 times on Saturday. And I feel pretty strongly that he will. Yeah. I, I think back to, I mean, it was a year ago today, Wednesday, as we record this, that Ohio State played at, or Penn State played at Ohio State. And it was what, six weeks into the Emeka Ibuka injury. And we watched him pregame just doing every single thing he could to try to be on the field and then still being told, nope, you, you're, you're not able to go. You're not able to go. And uh, I think uh, he's a kid who is really looking forward to this weekend. Maybe that's because he only had four four targets or four attempts at getting him the ball against Nebraska. Uh, I don't think 
with the way that Penn State plays defense, which is trusting their secondary uh, to to try to man up people while they really go heavy in the pass rush, I, I think that it's a an opportunity for Ohio State to make some things happen on the edge. We saw Marvin Harrison uh, two years ago in Happy Valley just slant the Penn State to death. Um, yeah. I don't know if that's going to be a Mecca Abuka doing that this weekend or if it's Jeremiah Smith, but I do know that those guys are going to have opportunities. And when, when a Mecca Abuka has had one-on-one opportunities, he generally wins them. It does feel like that's where Penn state can get got still. Right. I mean, th- this is not the, that version of Penn state a couple of years ago had some high end NFL dudes at corner and Marvin toyed with them. I, that's not the way that this Penn State team is constructed. They, I don't think they're as good in the secondary. And it's also why I keep saying, well, you certainly don't have to go prove anything about your ability to run the ball if you're Ohio State on Saturday. If you are trying to do whatever it takes to win the game, that means Will Howard, Ameka Ibuka, Jeremiah Smith, and Cardinal Tate. Like, that's it to me. Yeah, agreed. I, I think that you obviously the key to that is protecting Will Howard. Um, and, and that's the bigger point that's a bigger concern for me than if Travion Henderson and Quinshawn Judkins are able to to run the ball um effectively early or not I think it's about keeping Will Howard upright first and foremost yeah all right so we were hit the road on Friday heading over we won't be all the way to Happy Valley because you can't get there I uh, can't stay there what in this series on the field off the field is the one thing that you think of first for Ohio State, Penn State? Uh, it's back and forth between Joey Bosa um, pushing a, a running back into Christian Hackenberg in 2014 because that was just like that game essentially catapulted that team to the national championship run. Um, and then of the the comeback in 2017 at home against the Penn State where JT Barrett just became a different... It is, he just morphed into something else that we'd never seen from him before <laughs> and never saw from him after. But uh, that fourth quarter in 2017, especially because like Saquon Barkley returns the opening kickoff of the game for a touchdown. It That game, like this last Saturday against Nebraska felt like a game Ohio State could lose. And you're like, man, this this doesn't feel right. But like you're never, the you're, you're, whole time you're like, okay, still have the lead, still playing Nebraska. That Penn State game in 2017 was like, I've never seen an Ohio State team get like that just physically dominated from start to finish. It did not feel uh, uh, Clemson, I guess, in 2016 in the festival, but they did not seem like they belonged on the field with that team, and that didn't happen in the Big Ten. And then JT Barrett was like, no, we're, we're going to win this game. But <laughs> it was also the way that Larry Johnson's group in the fourth quarter of that game completely took over. And like it was one of those moments where you knew that Johnson had this reputation that you're like, man, he he's a really, he gets the most out of his guys. And he, it always seems to happen against Penn State, but I don't think I'd ever seen it like that, uh, what, what those right. guys did to Penn State in the fourth quarter. They were, they were unbelievable. Like that was, that was one of the better performances. But I think I, I want to be careful about saying this because I want to do it the right way. Since I've been covering this team, there are so many more memorable moments in Ohio State, Penn State, like virtually every matchup has been incredibly competitive and has a play or a player or something that happened that you will never forget. It hasn't happened as frequently in Ohio State, Michigan, and it does not mean that I'm saying that Ohio State and Penn State is more important than the game, but you just named a couple plays that people immediately think, oh, Joey Bosa, you remember where you were when that happened? And it overshadows JT Barrett playing on like an injured knee for that comeback. Even when Penn State won the game in 2016, it required two two things that you almost never see and you never forget with the blocked, you know, play bo- blocked kicks on special teams. But you have you have Benjamin Victor, you have JK Dobbins screen, you have the uh KJ Hill touchdowns, you have JT Tuimolowau's incredible heroics two years ago, the last time Ohio State was there. You mentioned yeah, Braxton Barrett. Miller in the two yard the, run of all two yard runs. The greatest, yeah, the greatest one yard run of all time, like uh, or two, whatever it was, was the greatest short touchdown run that you're ever going to see. I I wrote an oral history about that touchdown and otherwise like relatively quote unquote meaningless game in 2012 where neither team was going to go 
to a bowl game. Uh, that set the tone for every version of this rivalry, whether they call it that or not. I know one team is unrivaled and the other one only views one team as a rival, but this has been an incredible blood feud. So I can't even just name one because I think that this is the most competitive series in the Big Ten. And the thing that I'm most disappointed about is that it's going to go away and not exist every year. I wish that they could play this game in Pittsburgh. That's all I'm saying. Well, like, I didn't want to say how much I hate going yeah. to Beaver Stadium. Yeah, like because I'm okay, I do. I'm okay surrendering Penn State at home every other year if it means we don't have to go to Penn State ever because it's the worst trip we make. But <laughs> I would like this game to continue. And I think if you alternated it between Cleveland Brown Stadium and Pittsburgh, like I, I think that uh, you could we could find a way to make it happen. Just like the Florida Georgia. Yeah, Rivalry except just alternate it every year between being in Ohio and being in Pennsylvania. Yeah. I think they have to do that for the next couple of years. Um, if I re read that correctly, like they're going to play some of those games in Atlanta and I don't remember where the other one is. doesn't matter because I don't cover the, those teams. But yeah, Pittsburgh and Cleveland, let's get that done. Let's get Tony Petiti on the horn. Get yeah. this thing back on the, back on the schedule. Yeah. Um, other than that, I don't know. I, I, I just really, I do love this rivalry as it's emerged in the last uh, decade. I think it is, it's always, it's always entertaining. I mean, we were talking at the Woody on, on Tuesday about how in 2022, it's a 16 to 14 game heading into the third quarter and Ohio state wins 44 to 30. And yeah. you're like, what the hell just happened there? Like that, that game went absolutely crazy. Um, as Jay, you know, Travion Henderson rips off a 45 yard touchdown run with a broken foot. And then three plays later, somehow Mayan Williams gets his hand tangled up in oh, the, God. in the, uh, the yard marker. Like it, there's just weird things that happen in this game. And I'm glad it's not at night. I'll be honest about that. Uh, I, I am grateful that, uh, you know, we, we, we do our fair share of complaining about, uh, Fox big noon kickoff and how it affects Ohio state's home games. But in this instance, I'm fine with it. Remember when we covered a game there and there were no fans? Yeah, that was weird also. Um, but we got to stay in State College that time. Yeah, but it was still just as loud as it normally is. It was strange. Yeah, that wow. was weird that they still were pumping in crowd noise at that point. But I guess they, you know, if a tree falls in the woods and there's no one there to hear it, do you just pump in crowd noise? You're absolutely right, partner. Uh, Saturday noon, Ohio State against number three, Penn State. These have been three things on a Thursday. Thanks for hanging out with us all week. Still got Freaky Friday to come. Still have Buck IQ, and then everything on game day will be... Oh, and road breaks. Don't forget about that. Card Collector 2 bringing that to you on Friday night. Could be a lively one, so uh, come hang out with us for that. It'll be streamed live from beautiful Bedford, Pennsylvania. But this has been Three Things Thursday on the Podcast Daily. He's Berm. I'm Austin. We'll talk to you later.